Good evening. Good evening. My name is Matt Lindstrom, and I'm on behalf of the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you this evening, as well as our distinguished guests, Senator Chuck Hagel and St. John's President Bob Koopman. Thank you all for coming out tonight. <clears throat> as many of you know, uh, St. Ben's and St. John's have a rich history of graduates working in public policy and service, public service. And recognizing this, both alum offices recently worked with the McCarthy Center and established a public policy and politics chapter for graduates of St. Ben's and St. John's to better connect with each other as well as our students and the campus. And earlier this evening, the St. Ben's and St. John's chapter co-chairs presented the first Eugene J. McCarthy Distinguished Public Service Award posthumously to two exemplary graduates, John Brandel and Jerry Christensen. Many of their family members are, are here this evening, and uh, we're very pleased to welcome them, them and honor them this evening. We're also honored to have with us uh, tonight the chair of the St. John's Board of Regents, Jim Fry, as well as members of Senator Eugene McCarthy's family. I'm also uh, very pleased to acknowledge the support of Dan and Catherine Whalen for their generous contribution in establishing the McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. And thanks go to all of you for, for coming out tonight, but also for your encouragement, your support, your ideas, and yes, your financial support as well. We're gonna show a few um, PowerPoint slides, but before I do that, I just wanna make a very quick announcement that after this, tonight's talk, uh, Senator Hagel has graciously agreed to sign a few books. So if you do have uh, a, a copy of his book, he's willing to sign those uh, out in front here. There's also a few for sale if you'd like to purchase one. So uh, I believe I have an assistant here, hopefully, that's uh, ready to go with the technology. Just a few slides uh, to, to uh, kind of set this up a little bit and talk about Senator Eugene McCarthy, particularly uh, for the younger folks who, who may not know a bit about them. This will just take a few minutes here, and then we'll move on with the program. So the McCarthy Lectureship was established in 2006 to honor and memorialize Senator Gene McCarthy a remarkable and courageous individual, a man whose legacy reverberates far beyond St. John's and the state of Minnesota. So let's take a few minutes to highlight the life of Senator McCarthy before President Koopman introduces our distinguished guest. Gene McCarthy, who died in two, December 2005, came to St. John's at the age of 15 to complete prep school and graduated from St. John's University in 1935 at the age of 19, all right? That's 19. Now let me also uh, add that not only did he graduate at 19, must have studied very hard and worked hard, he also played varsity baseball and hockey, ice hockey, without helmets. Um, over the next 14 years, uh, we're filled with teaching, graduate study, St. John's Abbey for a year, World War II service, marriage, the beginnings of a family, even a stint at farming. In 1948, Gene entered, entered the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served for 10 years as the congressman representing St. Paul, Minnesota. In 1958, Gene was elected U.S. Senator from Minnesota, a position he held for two terms. Senator McCarthy is widely credited with changing the face of American politics by following his conscience, not necessarily his political party or popular opinion. Convinced that our Vietnam policy had to be reversed, he risked his political future in what appeared to be a risky challenge to the, a sitting president of his own party in the 1968 Democratic primary election. He did not win the nomination, but his courage gave voice to countless supporters, especially young people, and brought a new generation into the political process. After retiring from the Senate in 1971, Gene was a presidential candidate in five campaigns and remained active as an accomplished speaker, writer, and poet. Gene always had a great hope for the young and deep optimism about the capacity of education to establish a life trajectory of purpose and significance. Gene wanted college students now and in the future to resonate deeply with the same intellectual movements that had expanded his horizons and set his course as a student here. In this annual lecture, seeks to honor Gene McCarthy's distinguished contributions to the political, intellectual, and spiritual life of America by exploring the same terrain of ideas that shaped him. And in this way, we seek to rise up 
in, we seek to rise up in this and in future generations the same tenacious love for the common good that animated Jean McCarthy's life. The theme of the McCarthy Lecture is conscience and courage in public life, because this is what Jean McCarthy embodied. The series will carry on the Senator's deep commitment to the ideals and principles of democratic self-government, seeking to impress a new generation of young people, and indeed all of us, to pursue fresh ideas, to challenge the status quo, and to affect positive change in our communities, and like, the Sen and like Senator McCarthy, to lead with honesty, integrity, and courage. With that, I would like to welcome Father Bob Koopman, the 12th president of St. John's University, who will introduce Senator Chuck Hagel. I'm honored to play a role in uh, this evening's celebration. I had the opportunity to meet and visit with Senator McCarthy uh, a number of times during his lifetime, going all the way back to my student days in the 1960s. So I'm especially honored to introduce tonight's McCarthy lecturer, former U.S. Senator Chuck Hagel, Republican of Nebraska. In 1967 and 68, when I was a senior here, uh, Senator McCarthy opposed Lyndon Johnson's policy regarding the Vietnam War, even though McCarthy initially supported the, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that authorized American use of force in Vietnam. On August 25, 2005, Senator Chuck Hagel became the first Republican senator to publicly criticize the Iraqi war and call for the withdrawal of American troops, even though he initially supported the use of force in Iraq. Forty years apart, McCarthy and Hagel spoke out and challenged a U.S. foreign policy position advocated by the sitting president of their own party. Senator Hagel, uh, a native of North Platte, Nebraska, served in the Senate from 1997 to 2009. He was not a candidate for a re-election in 2008. He served on four Senate committees, foreign relations, banking, housing and urban affairs, and intelligence and rules. A graduate of the University of Nebraska, Omaha, Hagel served in Vietnam with the U.S. Army, where he earned two Purple Heart Awards. Following his tour of duty, he was a newscaster and talk show host in Omaha. His career in Washington began in 1971, when he became an administrative assistant to Nebraska Congressman John McAllister, serving until 1977. Hagel then became the manager of government affairs for the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company before returning to the governmental sector as deputy administrator of U.S. Veterans Administration. After leaving the Veterans Administration, he became an investment banker and business executive in Washington and Omaha. Chuck was named deputy director and chief executive officer of the Economic Summit of Industrialized Nations in 1990. He has written, co-written a book, America, Our Next Chapter, Tough Questions, Straight Answers, with Peter Kaminsky. The former Secretary of State and retired General Colin Powell said that Hegel, quote, writes with insight, expertise, authority, and with the credentials that come from his dedicated service in war and peace. So please join me in welcoming Senator Chuck Hagel to the podium for the third annual McCarthy Lecture. Father Bob, thank you. Matt, thank you. Uh, it uh, makes me a bit uneasy. Uh, they have retreated from the stage. 
When I uh, informed them tonight that I would do my best not to embarrass either one of them, I, I just thought that was a joke, but obviously <laughs> they attached a little more seriousness to this than I uh, would have uh, liked. I did uh, say to uh, my former business partner in Omaha and a very dear friend of mine, today when I arrived from Washington uh, in uh, Minneapolis, as my uh, phone was ringing getting off the plane, it was Mike McCarthy, it's a popular name uh, in these parts. Uh, Mike McCarthy, some of you may uh, know, is a 1973 Johnny's graduate. He graduated uh, with a very distinguished degree in uh, medieval English. And certainly that has prepared him well for life. <laughs> uh, in fact, McCarthy, when I uh, confronted him with that reality, which he's for some reason very proud of, uh, he said, well, what it did for me, it assured self-employment forever. <laughs> he uh, has told me over the years, Mike McCarthy, about this uh, hallowed sacred ground, and I have known about uh, this uh, institution uh, for many years. And I, I thought as uh, Matt was going through a, a little of Senator McCarthy's background, uh, that's a, a rather remarkable accomplishment, uh, graduating from college at age 19. Um, I uh, graduated from college, although it took me five colleges. But nonetheless, um, uh, I persevered, and it was probably in the best interest of the University of Nebraska to let me out. But uh, we, it worked out fine, and uh, I've uh, always been grateful to those institutions. I want to also... Um, uh, recognize uh, some individuals who have been already recognized tonight and noted, uh, beginning, of course, with Senator McCarthy's family. And uh, to Michael and Ellen, thank you for your continued leadership and efforts and carrying on in your own way and certainly uh, founding this lecture series, uh, what uh, your father started many, many years ago, which uh, I am concerned, and I will talk a little bit about this tonight, that, that uh, our country has lost a good deal of what M Eugene McCarthy was about. I want to also uh, recognize, as has already been the case, uh, certainly the Brandle and Christensen families uh, on behalf uh, of their father and husband, who uh, each tonight at dinner were recognized for their contributions to uh, this institution, to the state of Minnesota, uh, and to our country. Uh, as was noted by Mr. Christensen's son uh, in um, a very glib uh, conversation he had with us all, uh, Letterman kind of style, uh, <laughs> that um, uh, all of those uh, accomplishments were uh, significant, and he then said that uh, they liked taking the crystal home and the awards home, which uh, they did. They, they, uh, they took all the awards uh, tonight. So I suspect it's only right that you would ask a humble Republican from Nebraska uh, to uh, follow uh, in that wake, and I'm recognizing completely unworthy of being, uh, of being here, but nonetheless, uh, I am here, and I am very proud uh, to be here. I um, knew Senator McCarthy uh, a little bit. I uh, did not serve with him, but uh, he visited me on two occasions. Uh, we talked on the phone uh, more than twice. And, uh, of course, um, I uh, knew all about Eugene McCarthy long before I got to the Senate. And uh, like, I think, any American who knows anything about history in our country the last 50 years. They know who he was, what he represented. And it's truly irrelevant whether you agreed with Gene McCarthy or not on every issue, some issues. 
uh, or no issues. What he left, his legacy, and what he gave the institution of the Senate, and what he meant to self-governance uh, as, as referenced tonight in Matt's introduction and is on the posters, uh, consciousness and courage. And as I uh, respond to that tonight to try to blend uh, into the fabric of uh, this conversation uh, what McCarthy meant to our country and what we need to put back into our process, uh, as well as the realities of what our country and the world face today, uh, I, I want to uh, make some comments that hopefully will we'll tie together and make Gene McCarthy as alive today and as relevant today, maybe more so, uh, than when he served in the Congress of the United States. I uh, will begin by also uh, taking note of and recognizing uh, two of my former colleagues uh, in the Congress, former Senator Dave Durenberger uh, and Congressman Mark Kennedy, who I appreciate uh, both uh, being here tonight. Um, they are here to uh, assure that I tell the truth, which is all right, a, a truth squad. And uh, I shall try not to embarrass them uh, as well. But in, uh, in all honesty, I would have to tell you that uh, probably what uh, really pushed me over the top on being here tonight uh, was wanting to meet your famous football coach, <laughs> John Gilardi. Um, you all, I'm sure, saw the New York Times expose uh, on uh, Gilardi, which is a magnificent uh, uh, piece. And recognizing that I am from Nebraska and I do take note of football. Uh, I'm from a state that used to play football. Uh, the the uh, applause was uh, not necessary. And uh, it, I have a couple of Nebraskans down here and uh, I know you, you don't let many in uh, out here. Be, they bring bad habits with them, which I am not unfamiliar with. But uh, we're glad that you uh, are shaping and molding some of uh, these young Nebraskans who are sitting down here in the, uh, in the front row. Uh, I want to uh, begin with, as uh, Al Isley was so thoughtful to send me some uh, significant background material uh, on his uh, friend. Gene McCarthy a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I read, uh, as I always do, everything that Al Isley writes. And when I was a real senator and active, uh, I always let him know I thought he was brilliant uh, because he had the power of the pen uh, in that very persuasive Hill magazine. You never wanted to be on the wrong side of that. Uh, but in the explanation of why this lecture series was established. There was a quote from uh, Michael and Ellen, and it talked about what they wanted out of this more than anything else uh, was a scope that would bring out thoughtful discussion about our country, our policies, our future, uh, that would include not just the abstractions of policy, but poetry. Uh, the, the fibers of a society's fabric, uh, what it is about all of us and what makes institutions important. And as, as direct and simple as that point was, it uh, seemed to me uh, that it needed uh, some attention because I'm not sure that's where we are today uh, in uh, our universe of, uh, and I think I probably misuse this, uh, this general statement in the uh, arena of public discourse because public discourse has gotten so raw, so rude, so embarrassing that it has really debased our system and it debases us all. Um, any fool can get up and scream at someone. Any fool can 
run around and make fun of somebody or call somebody names. Uh, it takes conscience and courage uh, to find a solution to a problem. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes consensus. It takes using all the great instruments of democracies to try to bring together people. Is there really any question in America today uh, that we do need to address health care, for example? Various options, ideas, there should be. There should be. But uh, will we so allow the rudeness of the discourse to overtake the process that we end up with nothing and we fail our people, we fail our system, we fail our country? And the rest of the world peers in on this great republic and this great democracy and shakes their head and says, what happened? So this lecture series to me is as much about calling back our attention where it should be on personal conduct and behavior and responsibilities, not just office holders, not those only who have or have had the privilege of serving this country in some capacity, but the citizens the citizens, the news media. Do they have a responsibility? I think so. I think so. We all have a major responsibility here. And the civility and the honesty and the integrity that McCarthy exemplified, the directness that he was about uh, as he opposed an incumbent president, uh, on a policy that he felt strongly about. He understood uh, the vitality of a democracy. He also understood that as today fades out, the uncertainty of tomorrow uh, will not let him recapture what happened yesterday. That's over. We play for tomorrow. We don't play for ourselves. The 3,500 votes I cast in the United States Senate were not for me. They were not for my, uh, my colleagues or party. They were for my children. They were for the future. I can't do much about what's happened. But hopefully I can learn from what's happened, whether it's Vietnam or any foreign policy or war. And McCarthy understood a little something about when you commit a nation to war, the consequences that follow and the suffering and the killing and the dying, he also understood that somehow has to be balanced with the return on that investment of lives, of the bleeding not just of the blood of those men and women and their families that we ask to make that sacrifice, but of the treasury. Because every dollar that goes to war, that's a dollar being taken away from education or somewhere else. Or I guess as we've done the last few years, it doesn't make any difference. When we ran up a third of the nation's debt the last eight years. Responsible government starts with the individual. Responsible government, regardless of your party. Uh, I um, was occasionally questioned on my position on the Iraq war. Um, and it wasn't always particularly flattering, uh, the commentary. Um, but I, I uh, responded by first saying when I was said and when I was told that, that uh, I didn't support my party or my president. And my response was, well, I've been to war and I was in one that wasn't very popular. And you know what I found in that war, as far as I know in every war, that Republicans serve and die, Democrats serve and die, Independents serve and die, agnostics, however way you want to categorize yourself. And I've never seen war as a political issue in the sense that it's a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. And maybe I'm wrong. But I never have seen it that way. If for no other reason, then I've seen war close up. And the second reason, when I was often asked about why you didn't support your party or your president right down the line on every policy, when I said, listen, I like every member of Congress, like anyone who serves in office, when we get there, we take an oath of office. That oath of office is not, in my case, to the Republican Party. 
That oath of office is not to a president of my party. That oath of office is to the United States of America, upholding the Constitution based on what I think is right for the country. Now, I'm not unique in that, but I was never conflicted uh, with that charge that I wasn't a good Republican or I wasn't loyal to my party or to my president. Uh, that was the least of my concerns. That was the least of my concerns. But I do have a concern, and it is back what I was talking about earlier, the process. The process that we use in a democracy to find good people, honest people, men and women of conscience, of purpose, to offer themselves for office, good citizens to support them for the right reasons. And again, you pick your philosophy. You pick what you believe in the policy. But there, there is no substituting or there is no trading off the quality of the individual, because the quality of the individual, as we all know, just like every institution, shapes and directs the fate of that institution. And the United States Senator is only as good as the people he has around him, or as a, or as a president, or as the leader of any institution. And then the relevancy of it all. Why does a senator matter? Why does anyone matter? Why does this institution matter? Are you relevant? Relevant to what? Relevant to today, to tomorrow, the challenges, the issues, the threats. Institutions mature. The world is maturing. It is shifting. It is changing. We're not going to stop that. That's the way of the world. It is nature. These graduates from this institution this year, when they come back again in 10 years, they won't be the same people. Now, hopefully, this institution and before this institution got them, their parents and their communities and their churches shaped them into something pretty special. Then this institution further shaped them. What happens to them after that, they're going to have to sort that out. But they are going to mature. And they're going to make mistakes, and they're going to get wiser, and they're going to come back, and they're going to start sharing that, just as many of the instructors here are from, are from this institution. The world is changing at such a rapid rate today. It is redefining itself like no time in the history of man. The diffusion of economic geopolitical power is occurring, is occurring at an unprecedented rate. And it is happening in a way that no nation, no region, no alliance can stop it. And what it's doing in the process, as always these things do, it is shifting influences, it is shifting alliances, it is creating new centers of gravity of geopolitical power. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we're in the United States on the back side of our greatness. Could be, if we let it happen. But it does mean that China and India and Brazil and many other countries are maturing. They're developing. They're getting better and smarter. And we should not be afraid of that. We should embrace that. But we can only do that if we are secure in who we are as a people. We are confident in our system, in our process. And as all of this is, is, is transforming the world, and we are part of that, what it's doing, it's putting tremendous pressure on institutions, institutions of self-governance. Uh, I've been critical, and I've, I've said some of this in the book I wrote last year, uh, about our Congress, about our politics. Uh, are we still capable of self-governance? Are we still capable, the Congress of the United States, of bringing some consensus to try to find solutions to health care? There is no question in America today, not because I say it or anyone else says it, our actuaries say it, that we cannot sustain, this country cannot sustain the entitlement programs that we have on track right now. Uh, we're over $50 trillion in unfunded liabilities over the next 75 years in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And that because I say it, that when you run the numbers out, that's where it is. Now, we can say, well, 
Chuck, that's a long time out, no problem. Yeah, you can say that. But you know what is coming down the road? The Social Security Trust Fund starts to become insolvent right now in about 2017. That, that means then we have to dip into a, another fund. It doesn't pay for itself anymore. But all these consequences, like war has consequences. You better think through it when you commit a nation to war. Are you prepared for what's going to happen here? Are you prepared what it's going to do to your force structure and the families and record suicide rates and divorce rates and your position in the world? Are you prepared for this? Do you understand what is coming? This is an abstraction of saying, we'll send two more brigades to Iraq or Afghanistan, or we'll go to war, or we'll invade them, bring them on, dead or alive. Well, that's yeah, pretty easy to say. Then when you connect that to the fact that of the 300 million Americans in our country today, only 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent of our population is carrying all the burden. That 1 percent is doing all the fighting and all the dying and all the suffering. Now, peripheral vision is an important thing in life. Peripheral vision is as important as any element of leadership for a leader. Because what peripheral vision is and what it does and why it's critical is that you cannot make big decisions in life. Any of you are leaders in your community, and you all are, in your own spheres of influence, running companies, institutions. You can't make a decision on hiring people or any other decision by just looking straight ahead and not understanding all that's happening on the side here and how that's going to affect your company or your institution. How, what's that going to do all, in all the other ways out here, just rather than hiring two or three new people? It doesn't happen that way. That's what leadership uh, is about. Leadership should be about accountability. And as I drive back to the point of, of McCarthy's brand of leadership and in, in what he really framed, in what he said, in his actions, in what he attempted to do. And it was not in vain. I've never believed that uh, in, in a democracy or any kind of government that you fail in the long term uh, when you question when you are about trying to make a better world. And after all, what is the most fundamental, what is the most fundamental dynamic uh, of leadership or institution building or institutions uh, or politics? Make a better world. And if you're not in it for that reason, you don't deserve the confidence that is given to you as a leader. That is as simple as getting up in the morning, make a better world. Parents know that. Educators know that. Doctors, nurses know that. Why is it that politicians somehow slip off the side uh, on that? Well, you draw your own conclusions. And I'm not against politics because I uh, think politics is critically important. And I think it's an honorable business what makes it dishonorable are individuals. Just like Madoff, or just like some of the recent examples we've had from Wall Street. I don't think people want to give up on banks or institutions and go back to a time where there were no institutions or structures or no institutions of common interest like we built after World War II, and we built those relationships after World War II like NATO, the United Nations, World Bank, IMF, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, not because they were going to solve all the problems, no institution can, not because they would not be flawed, every institution is, because they're run by men and women, but because they established for the first time in the world order some boundaries for governments, some boundaries for government behavior and leadership behavior. Now, did everybody follow the rules? No. But think for a moment, if we would not have had those coalitions of common interest built after World War II, what would have happened to the world? And they did work, by the way. They worked, if you measure it, starting with this. And every one of our great leaders after World War II went to their graves, fearing what? A nuclear exchange, a World War III. That's not happened. 
doesn't need to happen. But I credit those institutions of helping us assure that that was not going to happen. We got a lot more problems today. The world is as combustible, as interconnected, and dangerous and complicated as it's ever been. But so is our capacity to fix the problems. No nation, no culture, no society has ever had the kind of capacity America's had to lead in finding answers to problems. But we will never get there if we so debase the process that we use to get there by tearing each other down. And the very tenets of what Eugene McCarthy believed and what he lived, the integrity and the honesty of public service and the conscience and the courage. Those are basic elements of the process. And so as we work our way into this dangerous new century, and it is dangerous. There are people that want to destroy America. There are people who want to destroy us. There are people who want to destroy the world order. All the more relevancy then is placed in institutions because no nation can have, does have, including the United States of America, the ability to deal with these great threats alone. Think of the great threats that we face today. And if we had time tonight to go through this room and you give me the top five or ten, my guess is most of them would be pretty close. Let's start with a couple. Proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. That's not something we can fix alone. The environment. Six and a half billion people in the face of the earth today, it'll, it'll be eight billion within the next 20 years, all elbowing each other for more water, for more energy, more protein. You think it's less complicated? You think it's, it's, it's going to be less peaceful unless we get some control over this? I don't think so. Stability in the world is, is as big a threat, instability in the world is as big a threat as we have. All of us, the whole world, all citizens of the globe. And we are citizens of the globe. We're citizens of this country. Sovereign nations will remain sovereign nations. In my opinion, they should. But that doesn't discount or minimize the reality of we have to accommodate the realities of what we're dealing with uh, in the kind of world we're living in today. Swine flu, pandemic health, no borders on that. And as sophisticated and rich as we are, we can't control that. There's swine flu episodes all over this country. And hopefully, by the grace of God, we, we will not see a problem, a big problem. But we don't know. We, we can't control that. Do we need any further evidence than the global economic crisis that has washed over this country and over every country in the world to tell us that this is a world completely interconnected and this started here? That's a pretty clear one. Terrorism. When we were the victims of a, of a terrible, terrible terrorist attack on September 11, 2001, it really was our first major experience with terrorism. Now, we've had episodes, certainly nothing like that. But that wasn't new to the world. Israel, every European country, South American countries, have had devastating terrorist attacks for years and years and years. But, but we've been insulated. So the jarring gong of 2001 set in motion a, a series of actions that the Congress took. 9-11 Commission responded, and we still got more to do. But the use of force, one of the things that we are finding out, have found out over the years, uh, cannot, in this kind of a new world, be, be the central focus or the main instrument of power that we use to fix the problems. It is one, an important instrument of power. It doesn't do you much good after the, ter the terrorists hit Wall Street or Washington. You can look for them. We don't know, still don't know where Osama bin Laden is. The way you stop terrorism is through alliances, through relationships, through seamless networks of intelligence gathering and sharing. You stop it. What's been in the news in the last few days? This issue in Denver and New York. I don't know how deep or serious that is, uh, but obviously something was there. 
That's how you stop it. Relationships around the world, accommodating differences, understanding cultures, respecting cultures, respecting differences. We cannot go around imposing our will, no country can, and saying, we're better. You need to subscribe to American values. You be like us. Well, there's no other country that I would want to be a citizen of than this country. Uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, by every measurement, we are the best country in the world. If for no other reason than we have a constitution, we are a nation of laws. Start there. And we have every kind of freedom there is in the world. Freedom of religion, freedom of movement. But I do occasionally remind people when we get a little too preachy, pardon me, Brother Bob, but <laughs> I'm quickly out of my depth in that area, but uh, when I remind people that half of the people in this room tonight could not vote in this grand republic 90 years ago, I don't think that's anything to be particularly proud of. What is proud, we should be proud of is we fixed it. Women couldn't vote in America 90 years ago. Took a constitutional amendment. You all know that. The current occupant of the White House, whether you, you, you like him or not like him, is irrelevant. Do you think he, a man of his skin color would be in the White House if it had not been for the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the 1960s, and people like Gene McCarthy out in front on that issue? I doubt it. I doubt it. Unless you were a white land-owning male when this great republic was founded, you didn't have very many rights. And we fought a, a war over slavery. But, but what is the, the greatest feature we have, as much as anything, is that we have the ability to self-correct. We have the ability to fix the problems. And what's in danger, in my opinion today, is that we're losing that ability. We're losing the ability and we're doing it to ourselves. And again, I, I, I use the current debate on health care in the Congress, regardless of where you are on it, screaming at each other, debasing each other. I mean, this is not what civilized people do if you want to fix problems, not at a very dangerous, defining time. And I don't know of a time, and I haven't been around all the thousands of years, uh, but I occasionally read, even from Nebraska, um, and I don't know of a time in history that is more defining that we are living through than this time right now. It is affecting our politics. And after all, what is politics about other than a very clear reflection of society? Politics doesn't lead. Politics is never led. Politics reflects society. It reflects the urgency of the issues. It's the process we use to find our leaders and decide on our policies and where we want to take our country or our state or your city. That's the process we use. The process is very important. It's just like the Middle East peace process. Or we don't have one yet, but if we did, we're going to have to find one for a lot of reasons. When people say, well, process, so what? Let me tell you why process is important more than any other reason. It absorbs shocks. It absorbs shocks. So every time there's a setback in the Middle East or wherever, you've got a process to absorb it where you can keep going with the ultimate objective. Fix the problem. Or at least in the Middle East situation, get it to some high ground so you can move to the next step on the high ground to accommodate different realities and then move to hopefully some resolution. That inspires confidence. And, and what, after all, is the currency of leadership? It's trust. And when a politician or a leader loses that trust, or if he or she debases that currency, it's over. You don't get it back. And you shouldn't get it back. That's another dimension of why McCarthy was so important at a very important time, at a very important time. Well, I, um, I would sum up this way, and I know we're going to have some questions. Uh, America has 
the most unique opportunity and capacity today of any nation on earth to lead, not impose, not invade, not occupy, but lead. The rest of the world will work with us. If for no other reason, with all the differences we have, and nations do have differences. Talleyrand once said that nations don't have friends. They have interests. That's exactly right. We have interests. We don't make our decisions based on what we like some leader. That's good if we, if we get along with the leader, we like the leader, or he's aligned with us. We make every decision in this country based on what is in the interest of the United States of America. There's nothing wrong with that. You do. That's predictable. That's good. We run into trouble when we don't know, when, it's, when you have a leader unpredictable. North Korea, Iran are two examples. And so we've got to find a 21st century frame of reference that's wider than ever before, that's deeper, that accommodates the common interests of more countries in more ways. Because only then will you build a structure to deal with the differences. We cannot define relationships based on our differences. You must define relationships based on our common interest. And in this world where there's no margin of error, and it is hair-triggered, we've got to somehow reorient our policy, our thinking, and our process, and our politics. And that's confidence in each other and all that goes into that. And again, what Gene McCarthy said and what he did. Uh, I've yet to ever find anybody in uh, the years that I've lived, and I haven't lived that many, that I would uh, immediately propose for sainthood. Maybe there is somebody, Mother Teresa, I met once, and she'd be the closest one. And I think she has been proposed. Uh, but we're all, we're all flawed. We're imperfect creatures. We make mistakes. But we need to learn from them. We need to get back into the game and, and do it right. But basic decency, basic courtesies, you don't compromise those. It, it's what every person in this room, I suspect, learned as much from your mother on this issue uh, as, as anyone else. When your parents taught you some, some lessons about life, how you treat other people. You can have strong opinions, you should have strong opinions, and you should voice them, but do it in a constructive way. If we do that, if we follow the McCarthy model, uh, then we're gonna work through this. And we are right in the middle of making some very difficult choices. This president uh, is dealing with as big an inventory of problems of any president I think we've ever had, maybe other than Abraham Lincoln. But in my opinion, uh, even bigger than Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt didn't inherit two wars. Roosevelt inherited a lot of problems. I recognize that. But this president, and this is not in any way uh, good or bad, or support or not support this president, but that's, that's what we're facing. That's what we're dealing with. And we have got to bring some semblance of consensus to bring back a, a governing coalition in this country. We've not governed for many years in this country. Um, and I've been, I've been in the middle of it for the last 12 years and left in January of this year. And I've seen how, how uh, we, we have lost our ability to self-govern because we've been paralyzed by partisan politics. We've let that take us over. Both sides, there, there are no good guys in this. We've, we've let this happen to us. And a, and a lot of it's been driven by the media. And I don't let them out of this either. Uh, and the citizens that have allowed it to happen. Well, I am optimistic ab about our future, about our country. Uh, I suspect, like any parent, I have a daughter who just started college at Georgetown uh, this year and a son who's uh, in a junior in high school, going through getting his driver's license, uh, driving his mother completely nuts. Uh, you've probably been there. Uh, but I look at these two uh, young people that uh, uh, Lily Bett and I have tried to nourish and try to teach and hopefully haven't made too many mistakes. Uh, and in the classes I teach at Georgetown and the young people that I connect with, I have 
uh, all my life uh, in Nebraska and all over. Uh, I am more hopeful than, than, than ever because of these young people. And I was talking today to a number of the instructors here, and uh, somebody asked me uh, how I like teaching, and I said, well, you probably use the term professor too loosely with me, but uh, uh, I said, young people represent the essence uh, of who we are, uh, humanity, the best of humanity. Energy, belief, honesty, integrity, passion, want to make a better world. And when you're surrounded with, with that kind of energy, that's a tremendously positive thing. Tremendously positive thing. And uh, that inspires us all and should. And uh, that's the hope. But while, we, while we've got the watch, uh, we can't fail them. Uh, and we, we will soon uh, be gone from our watch, as McCarthy understood, that uh, you can't go back and recover yesterday. It's all about tomorrow. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've been very uh, generous to bring me in today, and I can't tell you how uh, proud I am to be here tonight uh, with you to celebrate uh, a really remarkable American leader, Eugene McCarthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, how do you want to do the questions? Working? Yes. Here we go. Uh, we'll have one student on this side and then another student on the other side. Please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone. Hello, Miss Senator. Uh, I'm sophomore from here in Shenzhen University. By the way, I'm from China. You mentioned uh, it's the rise of the, some develop, developing countries like China, India, and Brazil. Don't be afraid of these countries, but embrace them. I really agree on that. And the U.S. should be confident about uh, the system we are running here. But in history, as the, it traced the, the way back to the history when monks from England to come to uh, U.S. say, because in, in the Bible says, Christians shall make others, all of, all of people in, who are not Christians to be Christian. That is totally in the Bible. And this is how America starts with these monks. How could you change, or how could this country change this, uh, this kind of thinking way and say now, we should not to, uh, we should respect other countries. We should respect the culture. We should respect the differences. How could we change this, uh, this kind of thinking? Thank you. How can we translate this kind of thinking? How could we Trans change changes. this way, okay. this, uh, how we think before? Uh, 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 thank you. Well, I, I think I said it um, in my remarks that we have our greatest, the United States, our greatest capacity uh, and opportunity to lead and change the world for the better uh, when we respect other people, when we work with other people. Uh, the history of the world is full of conversions. Uh, and I might add, in all due respect, recognizing the house that I'm in here, uh, religion has been more responsible for killing more people than any one thing in the world. Now, does that mean religion is bad? Of course not. What does it mean? Well, I'll tell you what this poor Nebraska kid thinks it means. 
is, is, is a straight intolerance uh, of I will not tolerate any other religion and you are wrong and I'll kill you. That's what's going on in parts of the world today, as, as we know, as we know. So uh, whatever your faith is, whatever your religion is, whatever your belief is, or if you have no belief, um, that's a personal choice. We all should respect that. We may not agree with each other on all, on all those things, but other countries, uh, as, as our Christian missionaries uh, and have been out for centuries around the world trying to make converts, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, um, as, as others are out uh, trying to convert people. But where, where we run into trouble is when we cross a line, not just in religion, religion's part of it, but, but, in, but in everything, our, our kind of government, our way of life. Uh, you cannot take a country, and, and you can name any country you want, in the Middle East, Central Asia, wherever you want to make it, and, and, and say, all right, you, you've had hundred years, hundreds of years of history and tradition, and you're a tribal society, whatever the situation, but we're going to help you, we're going to help you remake all that, because we have a better system. Well, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Is anybody here smart enough to figure that out? Uh, God love you if you are. If you're that smart that you, you can figure out the best system for everybody, regardless of their beliefs or their regions or their history or their traditions, that's good. I don't think there is anybody that smart. I've never met them. And that's what I'm talking about, how you bring some tolerance to this. The fact is, the fact is this, you've got six and a half billion people on the face of the earth today, you're going to have eight billion within 20 years, probably 15. And you are not going to have the American model used in every country in the world, uh, or any model you, that you want. It's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So this imperfect world that we live in, how do you, how do you live? How do you exist? How do you tolerate people? How do you guys tolerate each other? Uh, roommates, uh, people you work in offices with, talk, somebody talks too loud or doesn't respect your privacy, uh, you pull a knife on them or you threaten them or you say you're an idiot, uh, you're talk too loud, you ought to be this, and uh, I suppose some of that happens. But I don't think that's the way to fix the problem. So it, it, that would be a, a, hopefully a general response uh, uh, to, your, to your question. I use the word accommodation and I, I didn't talk about engagement tonight, but let me just add this as I end your, your point. Um, engagement is a critical element of dealing with people. It's critical for nations. Engagement is not appeasement. If you don't engage people, how can you ever hope to, to figure something out or, or to fix a problem or to communicate in any way if you don't engage? You can't do it. And so you, you follow the logic train here, and where's that going to lead you? Confrontation. There's no other way out because you put yourself in a cul-de-sac you can't get out of. Confrontation, war, whatever. Uh, and, and what I'm saying here is we've got to be, when I say a wider lens, our frame of reference has to be wider in our view today in the world than it ever has had to be before. And uh, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you give up sovereign government. I'm not saying you give up the passion for your religion or trying to convert somebody. That, that's, that's not the choice. That's a false choice. Anybody who tells you that. A lot of this conversation about the United Nations. United, United Nations is imperfect. It's got problems. But, but let's just look at something for a moment here at the United Nations. If we would not have had the United Nations the last 60 years, would the world be better off? Would it not matter? Would it be worse off? And my answer to that is what the United Nations has done. It has brought countries together where there's a venue, where there's a forum. And if a little country wants to get up and raise hell and beat up on America or whatever they want to do, let them do it. Is that not better than trying to kill each other? Now, that, that's what we did the first half of the 20th century and then well before that because there was no mechanism to try to resolve differences. As flawed as the United Nations is, and by the way, the United Nations does a lot of work, good work, 
very good work that no other institution in the world. Where do you think we have elections expertise? Now, we have fraudulent elections too. Uh, where is the one repository uh, when, when we need uh, humanitarian efforts consolidated? Uh, it's the United Nations. So, um, I, not to give a United Nations speech, but I, but I use that as, as just another part of the answer to your question. But I, I get what you're saying. Thank you. Senator Hagel, um, my question has to deal with public service. Um, how do we move forward uh, as a country when uh, we're at a time when public service is, has been so belittled, the idea of running for office is, you know, most people just are kind of turned off to the idea, and the idea of, um, you know, serving your country in any other way but the military is kind of just, people don't want to do it. So, I mean, how do we find our, our, our nation's character when mm -hmm. so many people don't want to serve our country? Well, that's a, a pretty critical question, and I uh, have uh, thought about that for a long time. Think about it every day. Uh, I teach one course at Georgetown Graduate School, School of Foreign Service, and these are young people, very accomplished, and not unlike uh, students here, uh, who have a purpose to their lives, and they, and they, um, they want to go serve. They want to make a better world. They want to do something. Uh, we each, when you say, how do we do this, we, we each need to instill that in our own spheres of influence with people. Um, these are important uh, jobs, and, and I know politicians especially uh, love to ridicule government bureaucrats, those dreaded government bureaucrats. And even, even, a, even a, a liberal Democrat uh, president like Barack Obama, normally the Democrats um, have a little more patience with, with government employees. Um, even he derisively said the other day, uh, we are not going to let those bureaucrats run your health care. Those government bureaucrats, they're implying they're very bad people. Well, when our leaders say things like that, and I'm not picking on the poor president because he's got enough trouble, but, um, and, and I've done it. I'm sure I've done it. But, but when you just categorize all government service as, oh, who would want to do that? These are terrible people government bureaucrats are lazy, you, know, you don't want to aspire to do anything like that. Well, are there lazy bureaucrats? Yes. I've seen a lot of lazy and dishonest people in the private sector, too. It wasn't bureaucrats that brought down the, 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 the business world and financial services. Yeah, our regulatory agencies fell asleep, so they take their share, too. But um, I think most would agree. Um, that little street called Wall Street and all the stuff that was going on there, uh, that's where it started. Now, our bureaucrats in the regulatory agencies, they've got to take responsibility too. But we've got to do a better job, all of us, of not deriding public service. And we do that every time we make those kind of comments. We should inspire people to do this. And you know, uh, it, it doesn't just uh, have to be government service. And we all understand this because I'm sure there's not a person in this room who has not done a lot of voluntary work, still does, very involved in voluntary organizations, having nothing to do with governments. But you are shaping and changing the world in magnificent ways. Rescue one soul. Change, change one young person around. Rescue one person. Uh, make one person feel good about themselves that they can actually do something. I mean, that's what it takes. And, and I'm very optimistic about this. I really am. Uh, I, I see a resurgence that, that this is unique to America, I believe. I really do believe this. I don't know of another country in the world that has it in its fiber and its culture like we do to do this kind of work. Well, there's no country in the world that has voluntary organizations like ours. I, I remember when I was president of the World USO in the late 80s, and uh, I wanted to raise some money in Europe because in those days, we had 250,000 troops stationed in Germany. So I went to our ambassadors there in Germany and France, and they said, oh, Chuck, you, the Europeans don't, that's not their deal. I, everything is done through the government, which is right. They don't understand the concept of voluntary service that, because the government does, does everything. So you, you'll never be able to raise any money. Well, I said maybe, but I wouldn't quit there, and we enlisted a lot of good people, a lot of leaders in the French business world and the German business world and so on. And the first time we tried this, um, it, was in, um, it was in Frankfurt in October of 1987. 
and we raised $3 million in one night. Now, we had Chancellor Cole there, we had Henry Kissinger there, we had some pretty big names there. $3 million in Frankfurt it had never been done before. And the, in the French, we did the same thing about a year later uh, in Paris. So my point is this. There are so many ways to serve. There are so many ways to influence the outcome of our society and make the world better. And, and I think government's a big part of that, but not the only one. And certainly churches and those associated with churches and schools are doing as much. I don't know, I don't know of, a, of a group of people who do it more than teachers. I mean, other than parents, who has more influence on shaping the future of, of a country? I, I, I don't know. I don't think there is a group. Teachers have more to do with the outcome uh, of a country and a society next to parents than any group of people. So I think that's what it is. I don't think there's any one answer. All right, we're going to take uh, one more question. Uh, I also want to remind you that uh, his book is available outside, and he'll be signing a few copies afterwards. So one more question. Senator Hagel, I, I appreciate your apolitical talk tonight. Um, if I can get at something that I'd like to get your thoughts about. Uh, I'm a Vietnam vet like yourself, and I have shared some of your uh, concerns with our involvement in the Iraq situation. Um, I wonder from your perspective, um, we're dealing now with a situation where there seems to be a crossroads here where we're trying to make some decisions as a nation about committing troops to the Afghanistan situation. And I wonder if you have some perspective on this and comments. I, I, maybe you could just, just discuss some of the dilemmas, what it means when we commit our troops to a cause or to a, an, a war, whatever it is. Uh, from your perspective, what, what do you think are some of the challenges that we have to look at mm -hmm. in this as we come up with these current decisions that have to be made in the next few weeks? Um, well, first, thank you for your service. We appreciate it very much. Uh, well, you have um, you, you just framed um, a very general uh, agenda of, of uh, probably as difficult decisions as this president will make, certainly in uh, his four-year term. And I don't know if he's reelected or not, but he's got four years uh, in this term. And uh, the decisions that he's working his way through now, and, and I've had some input in some of this, and I'm on the uh, Secretary of Defense's um, Policy Advisory Board. I was at the Pentagon for a day and a half last week. I was with the National Security Advisor, General Jones, over the weekend, and talked to the Vice President a couple of days ago. So I, I have some, uh, some ways in, and it doesn't mean they listen to me or I have any influence. But, um, uh, so I, I do have some sense of, of, of what's, what's ahead here. Um, I think where, where the president's going to have to really come down to make some tough choices in, in asking these fundamental questions. First, we uh, will have committed and in place by the end of this year 68,000 American troops in Afghanistan. That's already done. We've got 6,000 more to put in. Those commitments have been made. Uh, NATO troops are at about uh, 35, 40,000. So right now we're we're going to be by the end of the year over 100,000 troops in Afghanistan when you include NATO and, and our troops. Um, the, the second thing I think the president is going to have to really work through is, is this: what are the uncontrollables here? There are always uncontrollables in these things. Pakistan, uh, the ungovernable mountain range that separates Pakistan in Afghanistan. Um, the dimensions of that. Iran on the other side. India uh, has always been seen by the Pakistanis as their most significant threat. They're not, but that's where the Pakistan's mind is. We, we try to change that. Um, I think, too, where he's got to go on this, and, I, and this is very undefined, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of of a number of uh, senior members of Congress uh, on the appropriate committees. What is our strategy? What is the objective? For example, is it, is it um, um, counterintelligence? I mean, counterterrorism? 
because if it's, if it's a counterterrorism strategy, that, that requires a different set of strategies and tactics and policies versus a counterinsurgency strategy. That's different. Is it nation building? I was on Face the Nation about four weeks ago with Lee Hamilton, and one of the points that I made was that I think it's still very unclear to the American people, and I think most of the Congress, is that what you intend to do, Mr. President, is, is, a, is a straight out nation building. When you talk about development, when you talk about tripling the size of our civilian population in there and our tripling our development monies in there and funds and so on and so on, and you're going out and you're going you're gonna to rebuild everything, well, and the structures, and law enforcement, and the police, I mean, I think in any definition, that's nation building. Now, those are three, in many ways, very dramatically different strategies. And I think we're still unclear on that. Or maybe, maybe I'm the only one that doesn't get it, but I think it's just more than me. Um, I think the president is approaching this very carefully. I think he's, he's listening to all sides very cautiously. Uh, I talked to McChrystal uh, right before he went over to uh, Afghanistan. He came to see me for an hour and a half. I was with Admiral Mullen two days ago for two hours. Um, I tell him my thoughts on this because they asked me that they've got to figure this out. What is our, our, our strategic purpose? What's the doctrine here? Then, then they're going to have to match the resources with that. Now, you've got – I talked earlier tonight about institutions being uh, buffeted by – tremendous pressure and influences from the outside. Here, here's, here's one on this decision. You've all seen the latest polls where the American people are on this. Now, immediately somebody will say, well, but you can't lead by polls and so on and so on. No, that's, that's true. That's true. But let's, let's also examine why the American people are a bit restless on this. We've been in Afghanistan eight years. We're going to go into our ninth year next month. Uh, Iraq. Uh, seven years, we'll be going into our eighth year in Iraq in March. Now, I recall vividly uh, sitting in Foreign Relations Committee hearings when the administration, the last administration, came before us, these were all senior people, and said, for example, we'll be out of Afghanistan in 12 months. We'll be out of Iraq by the end of the year. These were four-star generals. These were commanders. These were Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, we had uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Deputy Secretary of State, saying, it won't cost the American people a nickel because Iraq's got oil. Well, we're over a trillion dollars now, and we're still putting five billion a month in, in Afghanistan and probably six, uh, seven in Iraq. We still got 130,000 troops in Iraq. Now, what the president's going to have to figure out here is the, that pressure that's coming in, that political pressure, because what the polls are saying, America's this about done here. Now, you can argue whether you believe that or like that or not like it or agree or not. That, that's irrelevant. Now, what's that doing to the Congress? My friends here and former colleagues know a little something about this. Uh, when the people back home in Minnesota and Nebraska and all over say, what are we doing, Senator? What are we doing, Congressman? Uh-uh. No, why, why, are we, why are we sending our kids into this continually? The thing's gotten worse. It hadn't gotten better. Um, that is reflected in the Senate. You've seen what the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee has said, Carl Levin. No more American troops until we get more Afghani troops out doing their own fighting. Uh, Speaker of the House Pelosi. I mean, there, there are others who've already put down a marker on this. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's one of the forces that I've talked about earlier tonight about how difficult it is to govern because these are real forces that are crowding in. I'm, I'm co-chairman of a task force at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, with the former National Security Advisor, uh, Sandy Berger, in, uh, on Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we had a, a meeting two days ago. And on that commission is the former chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator John Warner, who, who retired from the Senate uh, last year the same time I did. And so we, had, we got a lot of smart people on this, on this group, this task force, and so we were hearing of all kinds of theories and so on. And Warner said, well, now, wait a minute here. Remember, the Congress has a little something to say about this. And if, if, you, if you don't think that's true, recall 1975, when the Congress of the United States cut off all funding 
for Vietnam. And we had our troops out. You've got a corrupt government in Afghanistan. You've got the biggest drug problem they've ever had there. You've got a fraudulent election. Now, these, these are just realities. This isn't me saying this. This is just accepted. So they say to the president, the Congress, the American people, what the hell are we doing? Then you've got Pakistan, which probably has more to do with all this than anything, not, to, not that they're instilling anything, but the reality is Pakistan's a nuclear power. It's a big country. You, you've got an area of that country that's never been governable. It's all tribal. It's deep with religious problems and history and conflict. So are we going to put 100,000 troops in Afghanistan and 100,000 in Pakistan? Uh, Yemen, Somalia, um, huge problems. Are we going to put troops there? So what do you do? Well, the president's going to have to figure out a way that you use force, and, and we, we do need to use force, smart, wise, application of that force. The drones are very important. We've got huge naval and air presence in the Persian Gulf all along that area without bogging down armies and really taking big casualties and putting a lot of money in, uh, working with our allies. And then you've got to then come to this question, which really defines it all for the president. What is the risk dynamic in this? If we do not put more troops in, or if we start moving them around, then does, does that increase the risk ratio here? Or just because I put 45,000 more troops in, does that lessen the risk? Um, the 9-11 Commission, in its uh, findings, came up with many very good things, and the Congress uh, passed most of them. And I think for the, for the better, I think we did uh, most of the right things there. Not everything, but most of it. Um, one of the things that the 9-11 Commission reminded Americans, it wasn't so much the success of the terrorists on September 11, 2001, uh, as it was the failure of the United States, failure of our intelligence agencies, failure of our national security systems. I mean, come on. You've got a bunch of Middle Eastern guys who can't speak English, who are going to flight schools, and they are not interested in learning how to take off or land. Now, we did have FBI agents, matter of fact, in Minneapolis, was one of them, in Minneapolis, picked this up, and she sent memos into headquarters and said, you better come out and take a look. We got a problem out here. Oh, that agent in Minneapolis, she's goofy. Florida, we had agents in Florida at a flight school. Well, we had plenty of warnings. The, the National Security Advisor to President Clinton tried to get on Condi Rice's schedule and other schedules during the summer of 2001, tried to get the, the President Bush's attention on this. George Tenet, then the CIA director, talks about it in his book, said it many times. He went to the White House and warned, something's happening, put people on alert. We've got, we know something's going on out there. Well, it's not one person's fault. It's not one agency's fault. The whole system broke down. There's how you really fix the problem as much as any one thing. I hear a lot of commentary on, well, if we, if we don't fight them over there, we'll be fighting them on the streets of Cleveland. Fight who on the streets of Cleveland? Are you going to parachute these guys in? That's not the way terrorists work. They don't come down the street in Cleveland or Minneapolis, that is not the way they work. I mean, come on, guys, let's get, let's get real here with, with this stuff. So those are some of the dynamics the president's going to have to work through. He's got competent people. I think this is a very smart president. Uh, it's a tough call. It's going to be, I think, his toughest call in the first four years because whatever he says, he's going to get hit politically. Whatever he does from the right or the left, they're going to go after him. Uh, the media will go nuts, and uh, you're going to have one hell of a, a shootout here. But this guy, Obama, is tough enough, I think. He's smart enough. He will do what I th think he thinks is the right thing for this country, w whatever the political consequences. But it will set in motion um, all kinds of things, regardless of which way he goes. I think he is right in trying to get all the options. I don't think it's a matter of you either go ahead and, and put another twenty to 45,000 more troops in uh, or, or you don't. 
I think there's a range, something in between there. Then I think that's what he's, what he's looking for. There's a story in the front page of the New York Times about that today. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.